Well, I want to start our sermon today with a question. Have you ever had a bad day at work? I mean a really bad day. I don't just mean a day where something went wrong and it was kind of comical. I mean, have you ever had a really terrible day? A day where chaos seemed to win? A day where you faced your limitations and realized you weren't enough? A day where things just came crashing down around you? You ever had a day like that at work? You know, I've had a lot of days on the job that were rough or uh, where I was discouraged or even where I got injured, but I would say the worst day of work in my life without question happened on a Wednesday in March of 2016. It was the week before Palm Sunday, which is always a crazy busy time. In ministry, we were trying to get ready for Holy Week. Things were not going well in the church that I was pastoring. My plans and my vision just did not seem to be working. At a funeral to lead the next day, a, a prominent member of our church had passed away, and I was driving back and forth between the family and the funeral home to iron out last-minute details. I was trying desperately to get the funeral sermon ready. I had just talked to Kelly on the phone and told her, I don't know how I'm going to get ready for Palm Sunday. I just don't know how I'm going to get this done. So I literally said, I need to go to my office, I need to lock the door, and I just need a few minutes to just, to just think. So I got to church, I closed my door, and within a minute there was a knock, and one of my main staff members came in to tell me that he was resigning. So I prayed with him, and he left my office. Then I went back to my desk, and I remember I just sat down with my head in my hands. And while I was sitting there, I heard a gasp, and someone started crying really loudly in the office. And when I stepped out to figure out what it was all about, I found out that my friend, Scott Cooper, had passed away, which was unexpected. We knew Scott was battling cancer, and we knew it wasn't going well, but I think we all thought we had more time. So that was a terrible day. A, a day when I was faced with my, not, not just with my shortcomings, but with the challenges and the chaos and the, the brokenness of this world, it was a terrible day at work. You know, as we've gone through this series and we've talked about work, we've, we've talked a lot about kind of the good side of work, right? So we've talked about how work can be a, a place where we are transformed by God, right? We, we talked about how it was a place where we would uh, disciple and be discipled. We also talked about work as a place where we reflect God's image. You know, we talked last week about how God's, uh, we reflect God's image when we bring order out of the chaos uh, in our work and, and, and how we were made for that. And how that fulfills us. So we've painted kind of a pretty picture of work. But anybody who has any experience with work, whether it's a kid doing household chores or whether you own a multi-million dollar company or anything in between, knows that the picture isn't always so pretty. Sometimes our work doesn't work. You know, sometimes our work doesn't go according to plan. Sometimes, you know, the, the chaos and our shortcomings and e even death enter the picture. And despite our best intentions, our work becomes fruitless. Efforts don't succeed. Companies fail. Careers go down in flames. And when those moments happen, we know that things are not the way they're supposed to be. We sense that work is somehow broken. You know, it's not all that it was meant to be. Well, today we're going to talk about that aspect of work, the brokenness of work. So we're going to talk about the fall of man and how it has affected our work. And to do that, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3. So let me encourage you to turn there in your Bibles, probably like on page 3 or something. Genesis chapter 3. And today I want us to look at two simple questions, okay? Number one, why is work broken, right? What is it that's wrong with our work? And then number two, what is God doing 
about the brokenness of our work. So we're going to see three ways that the fall has affected our work. We're going to talk about what work outside of Jesus, okay? Just the brokenness of the world. And then we're going to see three ways that Jesus changes that. Three ways that he redeems our work. And like I said, to do that, we're going to look at Genesis 3, verses 7 to 24, kind of a longer passage. Um, So this is the story of the fall of humanity. This is where it all went wrong. We joke about it a lot, but this is a tragic passage. And, And today we're going to pick up the story of Adam and Eve right after they've eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So if you remember, God created man and and in his image, and he placed them in the Garden of Eden. They were naked and unashamed and Everything was good, but there was a problem. So in the middle of the garden was the tree of life and another tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God warned Adam and Eve that on the day that they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would surely die. So they had been warned not to eat of the tree, but the serpent, the devil, questioned God's command and tempted Eve with the fruit, and in a tragic moment, a moment that we all regret, she ate it. And she gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it as well, and sin and sorrow entered into the world. Okay, so that's where we are. They've just eaten the fruit when we get to verse 7. God's word says this, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God as he was walking in the garden. And God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, well, the woman that you put here with me, she gave me the fruit and I eat. Began there, ladies. (laughs) Then the Lord God said to the woman, "What, what is this you have done? And the woman said, well, the serpent deceived me. And I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you. Above all livestock and wild animals, you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, God said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat of the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow. You will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken. For dust you are and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve. Because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and he clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us. Knowing good and evil, he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life to eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Heavenly Father, we give ourselves to you as we look at this passage. Open our hearts, open our eyes, fill me with your spirit. Lord, we feel the brokenness of this world. We feel it in our work, we feel it in the news. But Father, today as we look at this, we're, gonna, we're not going to turn a blind eye to that. 
We're going to look squarely at the fact that this is a broken world, but we're going to find your work in the midst of it. So fill us with truth and fill us with hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Genesis 3 is a beautifully written passage. It's an insightful passage, but it is also a tragic passage. It shows the results of sin that Adam and Eve committed and the results of the fall. Now, there are lots of different results for us personally and, you know, for our relationship with God. But today, I just want us to focus on three ways the fall has affected our work. Looking at it through the lens of work. So, three ways the fall has uh, affected our work. We're just going to jump straight into these, okay? The first one is this. Our kingdom is cursed. Our kingdom is is cursed. So you may remember from last week when God created humanity, he gave uh, mankind, both man and woman, dominion over the earth. He he put us here as vice regents to rule over the planet and bring his order to the chaos. In essence, God gave us a kingdom. But in the fall, our kingdom becomes cursed. So notice in Genesis 3, God doesn't curse Adam and Eve directly like he does the snake. But he does curse their activity. He curses having children and he curses working. And he does curse the realm over which they rule. He curses the earth, the ground. And you know, there's a tragic irony to what God does in this sentence. It's ironic because mankind's two sources of blessing have become a source of pain. So, uh, if you remember last week, right after God created mankind, it says he blessed them and he basically gave them two tasks that accompanied that blessing. First, he said, multiply and fill the earth, right? So they were to reproduce and then he also says, exercise dominion, rule over the earth wisely and he has man work the garden, okay? So he's man work the soil. So they were blessed with multiplication and with work, with dominion. But now the blessing of multiplying becomes painful. It becomes something that the Bible calls labor. The word is itzavon. It means pain or toil or hardship, even sorrow. So that which was to be a blessing now mixes with a curse. And now the blessing of work, you know, working the soil, gardening and keeping also becomes painful. Work also is described as its avon, as labor. And we see the irony that the, the, the sources of blessing have become sources of pain. And there's also irony in the outcome of those blessings. So the, the, the things that the blessings provide are frustrated. They are reversed. So now as Eve gives life, there is the possibility of death. And now as Adam works the ground that he came out of, right, the ground that he derives food from, the ground that has given so much to him, it now takes. His labor yields that which does not nourish him. It yields thorns and thistles. And and now, uh, it's like the ground that Adam came out of is like sucking him back in. You know, verse 19 says, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. For from it you were taken, and you were, uh, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. And so we see that there's like this reversal, right? Instead of taking life out of the ground, it's like the ground is taking life out of Adam. So the blessing becomes painful, and it's reversed. Our kingdom is cursed. And you know, it's not just in Genesis 3 that the Bible talks about this. The Apostle Paul talks about it, uh, you know, and in, in, in he uses the word uh, matiates to describe the, the, the status of, of our world, the, the word that means futility or, or vanity or pointlessness. In Romans 8.20, Paul says, creation was subjected to matiates, to futility, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. And what he means is that creation has been cursed. It's futile. It's not able to achieve that which it was meant to achieve. It disappoints. And this state of futility affects all our work. 
Remember last week we said that the, the, the working in the garden is kind of a metaphor for all work, and it is. Everything we do is affected by the fall so that it almost never achieves what we want it to achieve. I mean, think about it. You work on something, what happens? Breaks down again. you got to fix it again, right? You know, sometimes people design great products. They go to all the work to do that, and it never makes it to the market. It's futility. Even when it does work, you know, like, we, so we do atomic research and we learn all this stuff about the properties of the atom. And does it, do we just use it for energy? Nope. What do we do? We make a giant bomb out of it, right? It, it's all futility. It always breaks down at some point. You know, this week I was talking to somebody who, when they were younger, they, 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 they were a, an athlete. They wanted to be a professional athlete. And they actually had the skill to pull it off unlike the rest of us who dream of being professional athletes. This guy was really good. He, he, he was disciplined. He was focused. He put everything he had into training. What happened? Blew his knee out. End of story. It's futile. So there is this futility, and work is now greatly diminished in its effectiveness. We work hard by the sweat of our brow, and we get thorns and thistles, okay? And this is our state. So we still bear the image of God. We still have the task of filling the earth and ruling over it wisely. We still have a kingdom where we rule as God's vice regents. But it's a very uneasy kingdom. Paul says creation is groaning. What he means is it recognizes our brokenness. It resists our rulership. Our kingdom has been cursed. So one result of man's sin is that the kingdom that we work in has been cursed. Now before we move on, I just want to say something. I'm going to say this real quick and I hope it makes sense. Uh, this has been kind of in my mind. But um, uh, I just want to talk about this, how this concept of, our, of the futility of our work affects our day-to-day -day lives. So, you know, the result of this is that we should actually expect frustration in our work. Right? We need to expect that our work to hit roadblocks and reversals. We need to recognize that the environment we work in is broken and that we are broken. So that in this age, work is not going to be what we want it to be. Okay, now I say that because sometimes we're encouraged to put a lot of hope in our work. You know, we often have this idea that if we just pick the right career, if we have the right training, that everything is going to be wonderful. You know, like, like, like we're going to be successful, we're going to keep on advancing, and we're going to be fulfilled. You'll hear people say, if you're young, you'll hear people say, do what you love, and you'll never work a day in your life, right? That's a bill of goods. Now, hey, listen to me. I especially want to say this to you. Right to you younger. No, but listen. You've been sold a bill of goods. Work is still work. And what Paul is saying here is a reality that we run smack into. That is that it is broken, it is subjected to futility. Work is specifically subjected to futility in this passage. So the idea that you're going to get your meaning out of your work and it's going to fulfill you and everything's going to be wonderful is not true. Be happy, okay? Sorry, but I just want to say that, right? The Bible gives us a good dose of reality, all right? So the first way that the fall affects our work is that our kingdom is cursed. Okay, now the second way that the fall affects our work is this. Work becomes a means of hiding. Work becomes a means of hiding. And when I say that work becomes a mean of, means of hiding, what I mean is that we use work as a means of controlling how other people perceive us. And how God perceives us, and even how we perceive ourselves. Now, this is more subtle than the first effect, the cursing of our kingdom. But I have to say, it's every bit as powerful. So let me show you what I mean. Um, so if you remember our story, let me ask you a question. What is the very first result of the fall? What is the first sign that Adam and Eve have changed. This is before security escorts them out of the garden, okay? This is before uh, God puts this curse on them, okay? So what is the very first sign of the fall? It is work. 
Not, not the fact of work. Work is good, right? Not that, but the specific work they do. Actually, it's sowing, okay? Sowing is evil. No, uh, but what happens? What happens as soon as they fall? Adam and Eve find some way, and I would really like to know how they did this, okay? They sow, how do you sow fig leaves, right? I can see getting 20, 30 foot of ivy, wrapping that around you, right? Maybe taking an elephant ear or a, a palm leaf or something. Nope. They sew fig leaves together to make an apron. Now, why are they doing that? What's going on? Well, they're ashamed. They realize that they're naked and they're ashamed. Listen, they feel unease about who they are. They are uncomfortable with parts of themselves, so they cover themselves. Now, what are they doing? They are working to hide their shame. They are working to control what other people know about them. They're like, you know, well, this is the part I want you to see, okay? But this is the part I don't want you to see, so let's just, we'll put a fig leaf on that, and we'll just sort of pretend that that's not there, right? Right? And what they're doing is they're using work to manage what people know about them. Now, here's why that's significant. Because we've been doing it ever since. Right? We use work to hide behind, to control what other people think of us. So we want to show people our success and we want to cover up our failure. We want to hide the parts of our character or our past or our abilities or our physique that, that cause us unease with ourselves. And we use work and accomplishments to do that. Yeah? We're like, hey, don't, don't, don't look at that. Okay? You know, I don't want you to see that part of who I am, right? What I want you to look at is this big shiny award I got. Top salesman. Look at that, okay? Look at my job description. You see how important I am? Uh, look at my grade card. Sorry, guys. Look at my, my degrees. It's like we're sewing an apron out of diplomas and awards, right? And guys, we, we do this all the time. We do this so much that we don't even recognize it. For example, this is so ingrained in us that I did it the other day. While I was working on this sermon, while I was praying. So, you know, I had to take a break uh, from the sermon for lunch, and during lunch hour I was praying about an area of my ministry that I really want to see grow, and I was praying hard. And after a few minutes of praying about it, I was talking to God, and I realized that I was praying not just because I wanted God's kingdom to grow, Right? Not just because I was concerned about the people that that area of ministry could touch. I was praying, a big part of the reason I was praying was so that I wouldn't look like a failure. Right? I, I wanted a fig leaf. I'm going, I, wanna, I, want, I want this area of ministry to succeed so that I'll feel okay about myself. I want to, you know, go, people go, he's somebody to be respected. He, he's somebody to be affirmed. So I had to recognize that motivation. And name it to God. And I had to say, God, I'm sorry, I'm making this about myself. What am I doing? But guys, we do this all the time. We, we use work as a fig leaf to cover our shame. We, we work hard. We're like, I don't know how, but by golly, I'm going to find a way to sew fig leaves together if that's what it takes to cover up who I am. Right? I mean, think about with me for a minute about some of the reasons that people become addicted to work. Workaholics. Some people become workaholics because they want to get rich. Look at how much stuff I have. Some people become workaholics to show that they're better than others. I'm going to beat you. In Ecclesiastes uh, 4, it says, I've also learned why people work so hard to succeed. It's because they envy their neighbors. Some people become workaholics so they can become independent of God and other people. Maybe when you grow up, you, you, you were lacking something, you had to be really dependent, and you're going, I hate that. I'm never going back there. I'm never going to depend on anybody, so you become a workaholic. Some people become workaholics to silence the little parent that is sitting on their shoulder, right? So maybe you had a parent who told you you're never going to amount to anything. You're like, I will kill myself to, to, to prove you wrong. Or maybe you had a parent that said you were the great hope of the family. 
Okay, so we work hard to silence that voice. But listen, it's not just workaholics, right? We all buy into that kind of thinking. But you know what it all has in common? Every one of those is a way to hide our shame. In our own way, we're saying, don't look at my shame. Right? Don't look at the fact that I'm not enough on my own. Look at how much stuff I have. Look, look at how important my, my job title is. Look at how independent I am. Think about how proud you would be if you were my parents. It's all about hiding. So we do this with, with, with others. We do this with ourselves. And we do this with God. I would throw up a smoke screen of church attendance or whatever, money I've given to the church, nice things I think I've done, right? So that I can hide what I'm really ashamed about, what I really know is wrong. Okay, so how has the fall affected our work? Number one, our kingdom is cursed. Number two, work has become a means of hiding. Now there's one more way that the fall has affected our work. Number three, death makes work meaningless. Death makes work meaningless. If this life is all there is. Okay, so remember, we're not talking yet about Jesus here, but death makes work ultimately meaningless. Let me show you what I mean. So in our story, we can see that death is a result of the fall, right? So God, uh, God warns uh, Adam and Eve on the day they eat of the knowledge of the tree, and uh, of the knowledge, whatever, that tree, that when they eat that stuff, okay, you're surely going to die. And we read the story and they eat and nobody drops dead. And we're like, oh, maybe they got away with it. But look at Genesis 3.22. And the Lord God said to them, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden. So God excluded, he banned man from the tree of life. Now, we don't know much about the tree of life. We, we don't know what the fruit was like. We don't know if eating it once would make you immortal or if you had to keep on eating it. We don't know whether they had eaten it before and now they were cut off from access or, or whether they'd never tasted it. There's a lot that we don't know. What we do know is that by excluding humanity from the tree of life, God is preventing us from living forever in our fallen state. It's a mercy not to live forever in our current fallen state. But it means that death has entered the world and it's become a reality for us. Okay, now here's the question. How does death affect our work? I mean, we can see how the curse of our kingdom affects it. We can see um, how, how, you know, the, uh, our hiding relates to our work. But how does death relate to our work? Simple, death makes everything futile. I mean, here's the thing. If this world is all there is, death wrecks everything. Right? If death is the end, nothing matters. I mean, think about it. If death is the end, it doesn't matter how much money you make. Right? It's all monopoly money. Right? It goes back in the box when you're done. You can howl and cheer and everything else, but it all goes back in the box when you're done. So who's going to care how much money you, you made when you die? It doesn't matter what your accomplishments are. It doesn't matter what, your posse what possessions you have. If death is the end, right? It doesn't matter what experiences you had, whether they're good or bad. It doesn't matter whether your morals are good or bad. It doesn't matter whether your character is good or bad. It doesn't matter how many kids you had or if you had kids at all. Because if this world is all there is and death ends it, it's all ultimately futile. And anybody who tells you any different is just whistling in the dark. The idea that I can say this is, death is the end and somehow find meaning, it just doesn't work, right? In fact, the book of Ecclesiastes actually sums this up uh, pretty good. So listen to what it says in Ecclesiastes 2, 18 to 20. So this is written by one of the most successful kings in the world. He has been talking about how wisdom is better than foolishness. But the perspective of most of Ecclesiastes is just this world, okay? And so he, he stops and he realizes, look, the fool and the wise man are both going to die in the end. And here's what he says. This is how Solomon summarizes our work, if, life, if this life is all there is. Verse 18, nothing I had worked for and earned meant a thing to me. 
Because I knew I would have to leave it to my successor, and he might be wise, or he might be foolish. Who knows? Yet he will have everything that I've worked for, everything my wisdom has earned for me in this world. It's all useless. So I came to regret that I had worked so hard. Okay, so what Solomon is saying is that if this life is all there is, our work is really is kind of for nothing, okay? So even if you pass on your stuff to others, you don't know what kind of people they're going to be. You don't know if they're the kind of people you will want to have made rich <laughs> or not, right? So he's saying death makes work meaningless if this is all there is, okay? So these are the three effects. There, there are others, but these are three effects that the fall has had on our work. Number one, our kingdom is cursed. Number two, work has become a means of hiding. And number three, death has made work meaningless. Let me ask you a question. Who's ready to go to work tomorrow? <laughs> right? Tomorrow when your boss calls and says, why didn't you come in? You can just say, well, because my kingdom is cursed and work is just a means of hiding and death makes work meaningless. So see how that works, right? I, seriously, this is a pretty dismal picture of work, isn't it? I, I, I doubt if any corporations are going to pay me to give this as a motivational talk to their workforce, okay? Okay, so, so but here's the thing. It's pretty dismal, right? So is there any hope for work? Is it ever going to be worthwhile? Well, if you think about my sermons for the last two weeks, you can see that we've already argued that work is, can be a place of discipleship, right? And it can be a place where we bear God's image by bringing order out of the chaos. So, yes, there's hope, but there's greater hope. And even in Genesis 3, we see a glimmer of hope. So notice that Eve is named in our passage, and she's not named Queen of the Dead, okay? What is she named? Eve, because she is going to become the mother of all the living. So something about this broken, painful childbearing is going to bring meaningful life. And we're told that her seed, her offspring, way back at the beginning of the Bible, is going to crush the head of the serpent. So way back in Genesis 3, in the darkest chapter of the Bible, there's hope. We're told that Eve's offspring is going to rescue us. And he does. Because we now know that the offspring that Genesis 3 is talking about is who? No, it's David. No, it is. It's Jesus, okay? And Jesus is the one who ultimately rescues not just us, but our work. Okay, so let me show you three ways that Jesus redeems our work, okay? So I'm going to be brief here, but this is important. So let me show you three ways Jesus fixes the brokenness of our work. Number one, for our curse, Jesus wears a crown. For our curse, Jesus wears a crown. So remember, the first effect of the fall was the cursing of creation, right? God subjected all the earth, all of subhuman creation to futility. Remember that Paul put it this way in verse 20. He said, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Okay, so God cursed creation. God. And remember that God gave us a sign of the curse. You know what it is? Thorns. Right? Because of the curse, the ground would yield thorns and thistles. They were the sign that creation was cursed. Well, when Jesus was crucified, the one thing that he bore besides our sin was a crown. Anybody remember what that crown was made out of? Thorns. Yeah. Yeah. So the Romans made a crown of thorns to mock Jesus as a king, but we know that it was identifying a greater reality, right? It was showing us that Jesus was bearing the curse of creation. He was redeeming our world. In fact, Paul doesn't just say that creation is subjected to futility. He he says more. Look at the context. Look at the preceding and the following words of Romans 8.20. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Why? What's so great about the glory that's coming? Verse 19, for the creation waits in eager expectation. Favorite verse. Literally, it's stretching its neck. It's standing on tiptoe 
to see what's going to happen for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was, sub- here's our verse, was subjected to frustration, matayotes, futility, not by its own choice, look at this, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. You know what Paul is saying there? He's saying that when our bodies are redeemed, when the kingdom comes, when we have our resurrection bodies, it's not just us that's going to be made new. Creation also will be liberated from decay. And and from its bondage to futility. So creation will be renewed. The curse will be lifted. Our work will become nothing but a blessing in that time. No more futility. No more fix it again. No more resistance. No more breaking down. So for our curse, Jesus wears a crown. The second way that Jesus redeems work is this. Number two, for our hiding, Jesus gives us confession. For our hiding, Jesus gives us confession. So remember, we said the second way that work has effect, or the fall has affected our work is that work becomes a means of hiding, right? So we work to cover and distract people and ourselves and even God from seeing our shame, our shortcomings, and our failures. So we want to hide. Just like Adam and Eve tried to hide behind their ridiculous fig leaf apron, okay? Now, in the story... God hints that he might have a better covering for our shame. He makes garments of skin to cover Adam and Eve's shame. But God gives us the ultimate solution in the New Testament. In in, in 1 John 1, 9, the Bible says if we confess our sins, meaning if we name them, if we speak them to God and admit that they are sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness so God tells us to do the exact opposite of what Adam and Eve do in Genesis 3 they tried to deal with their shame by hiding it right but God tells us to come to him and to put it out in the light He he tells us to sit down at the table with him to take out of ourselves the things that we think make us most unlovable the things we are most ashamed of, to put it on the table so that God can look right past it into our eyes and say, I love you. Jesus died for that. I forgive you. That's the way God wants us to deal with our shame, right? So so we don't have to hide anymore. Okay, so for our curse, Jesus wears a crown. For our hiding, he gives us confession. Now, there's one more way that Jesus redeems our our work. Number three, for our death, Jesus gives us the tree of life. For our death, Jesus gives us the tree of life. So, you know, this dark chapter of Genesis 3, this chapter where man sins and hides and creation is cursed and where humanity is excluded from the tree of life. This is at the very beginning of the Bible. Like I said, it's like on page three on my Bible, okay? Let me show you what's at the end of your Bible. Okay, so if you have a Bible, turn to Revelation 22. This is the very last chapter in the Bible. Revelation chapter 22. So we lost the tree in Genesis 3. Look what it says in Revelation 22, 1 to 3. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now in the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will serve Him. God's kingdom has become not a garden with two people trying to work it, but a great city with countless multitudes of people, with a redeemed planet all around it where we can go and explore and do our work and with the tree of life right in the middle with 12 kinds of fruit do not know what that's about okay but 12 kinds of fruit 
And it's not just for the nation of Israel. It's freely available to the nations, to all the people of God. And because of the Lamb, because of Jesus, because of the sacrifice that He made and the curse that He bore on the cross, all creation is going to be renewed. Our work will be a blessing with no mixture of frustration. It will succeed. It will fulfill us. It will accomplish the good ends for which it was designed. And we will live eternally, not as fallen beings, but as the resurrected people of God. So what has Jesus done about the brokenness of our work? For our cursed kingdom, he wore a crown. For our hiding, he has given us confession. And for our death, he has given us the tree of life. And we can work with that hope in mind. T tomorrow, when you go to work, you can, you can go and you can work to bring order out of chaos like we said last week. You can make it a place of discipleship now like we said two weeks ago. Your work can accomplish these things amidst resistance in the here and now, but it can do so much more in the future because Jesus has redeemed our work. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your kindness. Lord, what an incredible story you've written in your word. We don't even begin to sense the bigness of it. But we are so thankful that you've redeemed not just our work, but you've redeemed us. Help us to live like people with that hope. Help us to bring our faith to work. Transform us so that we can transform others and transform our work. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.